On today's photo moment, we're going to be talking about the GH5S in low light performance, but we're actually breaking this out into three separate parts. I will tell you what those three parts are right after the intro. Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first live three times a week show here on YouTube at youtube.com slash photojoseph, 9.30 a.m. Pacific. And at, uh, I said the URL, I said the thing, like I got it all out there. Hey, subscribe if you haven't subscribed, thumbs up if you like the video, you know how the whole thing works. And uh, hit that little bell to notify. So today's show is in three parts. This is all about GH5S, look at this glorious thing here, the GH5S and low light performance. But in doing some tests and doing some editing and Final Cut, I came across a couple of the things that I wanted to talk about with you. But I figured this really, really three separate topics, but not three totally separate shows. So I'm doing today's show in three parts. So the first part is going to be talking about the GH5S and its low light performance. I'm going to show you some results of shooting at 2500 ISO. Uh, we're going to look at some in-studio tests and some tests that I'm doing that I shot for my uh, blacksmithing project. So we'll take a look at all that in Final Cut. I'll talk about it, look in Final Cut, yay. And then part two, we're going to be talking about how to set up a Final Cut timeline for HDR processing. And part three is going to be talking about some issues that I've run into with the Atomos Ninja Inferno, which I have yet to resolve. Atomos has yet to resolve. Apple hasn't gotten back to me to figure out if it's an issue on their end. And frankly, it's a call for help. Let's see if any of you can figure out what's going on, if you have familiarity with it and you know what the heck is going on. So. With that said, uh, before we hit into the show, just remember a couple of things I'll throw up here. If you are using a GH5 or GH5S even, and you are looking for some training on it, do check out my training at gh5training.com. It's a five and a half hour comprehensive training that is focused on the GH5. However, now that I finally have the S, I will be adding on to that to include GH5S and also GH5 version 2 firmware. The GH5S will be a paid add-on. It'll be a small paid add-on, but that will be a paid add-on. Uh, the version 2 firmware update stuff will be free for those who've already bought the GH5 training. So keep all that in mind, gh5training.com, if you want to learn all about that. And yeah, we do the rest of it later. Let's just get into the show. Okay, so GH5S, its big thing, one of its big features is its low light performance because it has dual native ISO. It has its sensor, I don't know how the heck this works, but it's got, in its sensor, it has dual native ISO. It can shoot at 400 native or at 2500 native. And when you say native, what that basically means is this is the optimized uh, setting for the sensor. This is where you're going to get the best performance, the largest dynamic range and lowest noise. That is as close to perfection as you're going to get off that sensor. Usually you have one native ISO. This camera has two native ISOs. So that means you can shoot at 2500. And as you're going to see in a moment here, have virtually no difference between 2500 and 400, which is kind of crazy remarkable. And I'm going to show you, there is, there is the slightest little difference. And we're going to take a look at that. We're going to, we're going to explore what that actually is. Uh, so we're going to start looking at footage that is shot in the studio, just some side-by-side -side tests in good light, just to see the difference between the two. And then we're going to look at shots that I did for a blacksmith shoot project that I'm working on. These are test shots, so um, just to see what the performance is like, what the actual lighting conditions is like, and so on. We're also going to take a look at some of, the setting, some of the settings in the camera itself. And so let's actually start with that. So let me switch over to, let's bring the menu up on here and bring up this setup, there we go. So there's the menu system on the GH5S. If you go into the wrench with the C on it, so the, the custom settings wrench there, custom thing, go into exposure, uh, at the very top, there's dual native ISO setting. And then underneath that is ISO increments. By default, it's gonna be set to one EV. This is bad. You need to set it to 130 EV. And the reason for that is if you set it at one EV, you can't actually get to the native ISO of 2500. Odd, but true. So. First thing you do when you get out of the box, set it to 130V. Second thing you do is go up to the dual native ISO settings and you can choose between auto, low, and high. I'm telling you that almost always auto is gonna be perfectly fine. And let me explain why. So we're gonna start by setting it to low. And now I have to switch over to the full view here. Jump out of this, bring up the ISO command. And at low, your native is 400. There's no indicator in here of what is native, but look at the bottom of the screen there, it's 400. You'll see this goes all the way down to a low of 80 and up to a max of 1250. So if you're in the low ISO setting, you can go from 80 up to 1250 and that's it. Now let's go back into the settings, set this to high, bring the ISO controls back up again, and you notice it starts at 1250 and works its way up, 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 all the way to 51,200. That's kind of huge. Uh, anyway, so 
the low point is 1250. Okay, so now you're going, okay, so the low, it goes up to 1250, and the high starts at 1250. So wait a second, there's a crossover point. And there is. 1250 is the crossover. 1250 is the only ISO that is available for both low and high. So what this means is if you leave it in auto, if you are at 400 or anything under 1250, it's going to be defaulting to the low ISO and then adjusting gain to compensate. If you go above 1250, it's going to be at the 1250 and adjust gain to compensate. So there's no way, it's impossible for you to set the camera to 2500 ISO and be shooting at the 400 ISO gained all the way up to 25. That's not possible. The camera can't do that. If you're at 2500, it is the native 2500. If you're at 400, it is the native 400. So you don't need to worry about that. The only position where it becomes a concern is at 1250, at that crossover point. So what is the technical difference between the 400 and the 1250? This is where I have notes to make sure I give you the right info here. So 400, okay, the base 400 has slightly greater dynamic range, but also slightly higher noise. So you get a little more dynamic range in the 400 base with a little bit more noise. Odd that you have a little bit more noise at the 400, but that's, that's the way it's put together. At the 2500 base ISO, you have a slightly lower dynamic range and a slightly less sensor noise. So there's your, your kind of, your, your compromise, if you will. So at 1250, 1250 is the one position, the one single ISO where it could be either based off of 400 or off of 2500. So you have to decide, do you want, if you need to shoot at 1250, right, my setup, my scene, I have to shoot at 1250, that is my ISO. Do I want slightly higher dynamic range and slightly higher noise? In which case, go for the 400, <laughs> see, that's why I had to take the notes. Or do I want slightly lower dynamic range for slightly lower noise? In which case, you want to base it off of the 2500, the higher ISO setting. For the most part, it's not going to matter. How often are you actually going to shoot at exactly 1250? Personally, set it at auto and just go and shoot and don't worry about it. But if you ever need to have that at 1250 and you want to make that decision, you can. The camera will default, by the way. It defaults to the lowest noise mode which means it's defaulting at 1250 if you're in the auto. It is going to default to the 2500 base, gaining down to 1250. That's where it's going to be. Okay, so there's that. Super important setup on there that you understand that, uh, that you understand how the setting is, and really, really important that you understand you have to set it to one-third ISO, so that you can, uh, one-third settings, so that you can get to the full, true native ISO on there. So, superb. Uh, all right, so that's the camera setting I want to talk about. Obviously, there's a lot more about the camera, but that's what I wanted to show you. Now let's talk about this setup. This is mostly what I use to do the test shots, except for the lens. Uh, we'll come to the lens in a moment here, but let's just here. I've got look. I've got a glorious close-up of this. Oh, so beautiful! Uh, it is in my small rig cage, which I am really quite liking. I'm quite fond of this thing. You may have noticed from those who've seen this before that I have added the uh, the helmet on here. I don't. I'm not actually using this right now, but one of the reasons I put the helmet on and I'm leaving it on is because it makes positioning of the handle with the um, Ninja on top and with a microphone a little bit cleaner. It just it just kind of works better. It makes the rig a little bit bigger. It only takes about five minutes to take it apart and put it back together without this, but I'm, I'm digging that on there. Obviously, if you don't have the XLR1, then there's no need for that, but there you go. So this is how I shot it, shooting to the Atomos Ninja Assassin. Okay, uh, Ninja Inferno, sorry. Why would I shoot to the Inferno? Let's start with that. Internally on the camera, you can shoot got all the numbers, right? Ultra HD, so we're, we're only talking 4K here, Ultra HD. You can shoot 8-bit um, up to 60p. You can shoot 10-bit up to 30p. But you can't shoot 10-bit and 60p. For that, you require going external to the Ninja. The other advantage of shooting to the Ninja is that you're shooting to ProRes. So you're having an, about an 800 megabit recording versus the maximum of 400 megabit internal versus the standard of 150 megabit internal. So considerable difference in there. So I figured I got the toys, let's go for the absolute max quality. So 4K, 60p, 10-bit, two ProRes on this thing. Um, the Inferno has, uh, this is, it's kind of cool. I really like this product. It's got dual batteries on there so you can swap them out as you go. Uh, you, know, you don't have to worry about one dying and going blank on the screen. You can just pop it out. So if you're doing a really long recording or you just don't want to shut down and restart it, you can just pop a new battery on, take the dead one off, put a new one on there. And it records to SSD. So there's an SSD drive. This is a terabyte, well, 960 gig SSD. And so you can shoot a bunch on there. And if you've never played with one of these before, when you go into the settings, you can choose what level of ProRes you want. It tells you exactly how much footage you, uh, how much capture time you have, yada, yada. It's, it's, it's pretty awesome little toy. So that's on there. 
the lenses. Every shot that I'm going to show you in a moment here, shot in the uh, in the blacksmith shop, was shot on one of three lenses here. So it was shot either with the Noctocron, which probably most of it was, because you know it turns out that that blacksmithing thing is kind of hot and there's sparks, and I don't want to get my camera too close to that stuff. So shot a lot of it with this, mostly wide open, so you get that super shallow depth of field, but not always because. And I'm not going to be able to tell you which shots were wide open, which ones weren't, but not always because sometimes, you know, you need a little bit more depth. But shot with a Noctocron, or some of them were shot with my Zhongyi 25mm f0.95. By the way, all of these will be linked down below if you're curious about any of these things. And then a couple of shots, or maybe just one shot, was shot on the 15mm Leica f1.7 for a little bit wider shot. Um, all of them shot with variable NDs on them. Uh, I get asked a lot about variable NDs. I can tell you that I haven't done any comprehensive testing. But out of a desperate need for a, a variable ND quickly and not wanting to spend a lot of money, I found this one on Amazon from a company called Fotiga, F-O-T-G-A. I now own three of these. They're great. And they're like 15 bucks, 20 bucks. They're really inexpensive. I am sure, optically, they're not as good, not as clean, not as pure as many of the more expensive ones, I would hope. But they're great. They've been working just fine for me. I haven't seen anything that I go, oh, that's kind of gross. There's some weird color cast. I'm digging them. So for the money, you can't argue with these things. So that was that setup. If you're wondering what the heck is going on here with this Canon lens on here, you're going, hold on a second. There's a Canon lens on there. Um, this, I talked about this briefly before. I will be doing a comprehensive look at this later. But this is an adapter from a company called Pixco. These are really inexpensive adapters. I love all the really inexpensive stuff that's coming for these cameras. This is... Unlike the uh, Metabones, which actually has glass in it, these do not have any glass in it. This is just a hole. So there's one that is literally just a hole. It just attaches to the, it allows you to attach your Canon or Nikon or whatever lens to your Micro Four Thirds camera. Uh, then the second version of it has a built-in aperture because there's no electronic communication, so you cannot actually control the aperture in the lens natively like you could with the Metabones adapter. So it's super cheap. It's just basically a, an adapter that is built at the exact right distance to hold the lens at the right distance, but it does work. And again, if you want to see a test of what this looks like, I shot something yesterday in the falling snow, uh, just a shot of myself stepping towards the camera at 240 frames per second on the GH5S with this 50 mil uh, uh, Canon lens at wide open at f1.2, so super shallow depth of field. It's kind of cool. I just kind of very slowly step in. You can see the snowflakes that are in the plane of focus coming. It's, it's cool. You check it out. It's on my Instagram, Photo Joseph. Go check that out. Okay. That is everything about the camera, I believe. It is time to look at some files. So uh, let's bring that up. I'm going to start with a screenshot to show you a comparison, then we're going to look at some video files. Before we do that, uh, just let me remind you of our value for value proposition. If you are watching this show and you feel like you're learning a thing or two today, then please, please, please consider contributing. Consider putting some value back into the company, back into the show. Uh, there's four different ways you can do that. Just go to photojoseph.com slash support. You can contribute monthly if you want to via Patreon, anywhere from a dollar on up, uh, or same thing via PayPal, or do a direct one-off contribution via PayPal or Apple Pay or whatever, Venmo or whatever you like. You can purchase stuff through my affiliate link. Uh, there is a, uh, I had this thing called kit.com. It's kind of awesome, actually. Kit.com slash photojoseph. You'll see I have a bunch of different kits there built up of different packages that you can buy. Or the most interesting kit is one that is called As Seen on Photo Joseph's Photo Moment. And if you're watching today's show, then you'll go there and you'll see at the top of that everything we talked about today. Um, and then the last one, of course, is that you can hire me directly to help you set up your shoot, your rigging, your streaming, whatever you might need. So value for value, photojoseph.com slash support. Thank you very much. All right, now let me open this right file here. And let me actually use two of these here. We have both of these open. And let's take a look at what I got. Let's just take this full screen. So this is, what you're looking at here is a side-by-side, -side, obviously the exact same shot. You see on the left, it's ISO 2500. And in a, 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 a desire to keep the aperture the same, I changed the shutter angle. So it's ISO 2500, 30 degree shutter, f4.5. The shutter angle doesn't matter. Nothing was moving, so we're not going to get any kind of motion blur in there. Shot at 420, 8-bit, so internal. Second shot over here on the right is ISO 400, 180-degree shutter, so ISO at f4.5. So again, same aperture, same, uh, well, not same ISO, but the ISO, base ISO of 400 on the right, base ISO of 2500 on the left, and 30-degree versus 180-degree shutter. At first glance, they look virtually identical. Okay, so that's useless, right? So now let's look at a different version of the same picture where I did a little split screen on here. And I realized that you are now looking at this on a 1080p YouTube broadcast, so you can't really appreciate the difference in here. But 
let me tell you, let me see, actually, can I zoom into this anymore? I don't know if this will really show too well on here, but what we're seeing here, the difference that you probably cannot see. So again, on the left is the 2500, on the right is the 400. There is slightly, slightly less noise in the 2500 shot, but there's also slightly, slightly less detail. So my interpretation of what's happening here is that there is a denoising algorithm. Very, very subtle, but a very subtle denoising algorithm being applied at the 2500 ISO that is cleaning up the, the noise that's in there, but simultaneously removing ever so slightest bit of detail. Unless you're pixel peeping it, I really don't think you're gonna notice. I had to look pretty closely to see it, but that's my interpretation of what's happening there. I don't know these things, you know, I'm not an engineer, but that's what I think is happening here. And other than that, the fact that the left is 2,500, I saw the right is 400, that's pretty darn awesome. So there is that. So that's, that's the first thing. I just wanted to show you that. Now, let's actually look at some video. So off to Final Cut Pro. Oh, what I left out of the whole shooting configuration is that I'm shooting in V-Log so that I have maximum dynamic range, maximum room for grading. So let's take a look at these shots in V-Log in SDR, standard dynamic range. We're gonna look at those first and then we're getting into parts two and three, getting into high dynamic range and some specific stuff on the Atomos. So with that said, let's take a look at the setup in here. All right, I have, uh, let's close this thing here actually. Let's get rid of that, give us a little extra room in here. All right, so I got a bunch of shots on the timeline. These are straight out of the camera. No adjustments applied to these. You can see the flat profile that they are. If you look at the waveform up here, if I, let's actually get a slightly more dynamic range shot. There we go. If you look at the waveform up here, you can see how flat it is. So here's zero, that is black. There's 100, that is white. Anything above 100 is super white. Anything below zero is super black. And generally, for all intents and purposes, we want to keep our shot well within zero to 100. If you look at the shot, it's clearly quite flat, and it even looks quite noisy. I mean, that's, you know, it looks noisy, but this is not how it's meant to be used. This is not how it's meant to be looked at. It's meant to be looked at with a color grade and or a LUT applied. So let's just take a quick scan through these shots here just to show you what I got on here. And what's really cool about this, actually, let's just park on this one for a moment here. What's really cool about this is look at, this is black, black rock. This is obviously extremely, extremely hot and extremely bright. And yet, other than the hottest, hottest center of this, we're seeing the full range of the image in here. Now, yes, this does look noisy because we haven't done any grading to it yet, but I wanna show you the flat profile first so you can see exactly how it looks. So now, see, I'll just see a couple of the shots, you know, just kind of scan through the timeline there. I did one, like, this is insane. He's got this oven that goes up to like a billion degrees. It's, it's insane. This is, it's just like true on, full on blacksmithing. This is pretty awesome stuff. Uh, anyway, so you can see, quick scan through the shots. Okay, so there's what it looks like. I'm gonna select all of those, go to the inspector, and I'm going to enable the Panasonic V-Log LUT. And now we see what the shots look like essentially natively. And you can look at the dynamic range on the left. You can see in the, in the uh, waveforms, we have stretched them out. We actually still haven't gotten all the way down to black or even all the way up to white, but we are definitely pulling on the range on there. So now we can get into, there's a shot there. Here, let's use this one. Now we can get into our creative grading on here. And this, you can see we still got some room to go on the blacks and we still got some room to go up here. Not a whole lot to go on the whites, but we have a little bit. So I could go into the grade here and do something like pull the shadows down so we get those all the way down to black. And I'm gonna wanna grade this quite crunchy. I'm gonna make this look like really kind of rich and delicious. Uh, maybe I'll pull the highlights up a little bit more. And that is a very, very quick one pass grade at what this looks like. So if I play through that, you can see what that looks like. And that is pretty, pretty slick, pretty cool. Now when I, we do the actual shoot, we're gonna do a little bit different lighting. We're actually gonna, uh, he's gonna use a different type of coal in the, uh, in the furnace. So it gets all smoky in the room. It's gonna look really, really cool. But this is where we're at right now. So this is the first uh, first test shots. Um, you can see, so that's without an additional grade. So let me actually, let's go back to here. Where was that shot I just worked on? Let's say I wanted to do a little bit of uh, color tweaking to it. Maybe I wanted to kind of cool my shadows a little bit so I can go up here and let's pull into my shadows, add a little bit of kind of aqua, cool toning into the shadows. And then let's just go up here and add a hue saturation curve. I love the new color grading tools in Final Cut 10.4, which is incidentally what we're looking at. 
Uh, if I wanted to make, let's say, these reds here a little bit more saturated, so you got hue versus saturation. I grab the eyedropper, click on the reds. It drops three control points, so a center point and then two edge points. I grab that center point and I can saturate or desaturate just the red on there. So I want to kind of goose that up and make it look a little bit more dynamic. Pretty cool looking in there. Let me go back to the other wheels here. I want to pull my mid-tones down a little bit, make it a little bit overall darker. I really want this to be a dark scene where the bright burning parts are really pulling out. Okay, so I'm going to take that, hit Command-C to copy, select everything, Command-Shift-V to paste. We're going to paste the color wheels and the saturation curves. And just like that, we now have, let's go to the top of this. No, there is no audio on this. Um, now we have a quick look at the first pass of the shots on there, which is in my humble opinion, pretty stinking cool. This is going to be a lot of fun to work with, a lot of fun to do the final edit on. I think it's going to look absolutely beautiful. Okay, this is a long shot. There we go. Um, that one's probably a little bit too dark. Oh, well, it's actually, oh, look at that. <laughs> Opened up the lens. Um, yeah, this is, this is cool stuff. So I'm digging it. This is going to be a lot of fun to play with, a lot of fun to put together. And again, shot with those uh, one of those three lenses that I showed you, the Noctocron or the 25mm Xiongyi or the 15mm Leica. And there we go. So there's there's the first look. Ooh, look at that. Oh, and some of these I went to a really fast shutter angle so that I could capture those sparks going really nicely. Um, it's it's pretty awesome. I don't know. What do you guys think? I'm I'm kind of stoked with it. I think this is going to be. I think it's gonna look really really cool. Okay, so that's the first part of it. That's what I wanted to show you to begin with. So we're setting up. We're not doing anything special in Final Cut at this point. We're just working in a SDR standard dynamic range timeline like you always have bringing this high dynamic range footage, and by high dynamic range, what I really mean is V-log um, footage that is has a compressed look, that flat look, expanding it out to make it look really good for the screen. Super, loving it, looking good. So now we're gonna move into part two. Part two of the show is going to be about how to set the, how to set Final Cut up for high dynamic range, for an actual HDR setup. And then part three is going to be about the Atomos Ninja Inferno and some little oddities that I ran into in there. So we'll be right back for part two of today's show.